I'd like to start with a quick one. If you are at the back, we'd like to have a close and intimate conversation. Our first session is going to be a wonderful one. We have our speakers here. I'm kindly requesting um, Tamina. I, all of us are familiar with Tamina. If you could guide the rest, everyone who is, uh, I guess, two rows in front of you, uh, just please come down. Let's take a, a quick 30 seconds to do that. Tamina is going to be ushering committee and anyone else who can assist with that. Thank you so much for being here. Um, just like Brenda mentioned, I believe all of us have uh, interacted with Brenda even previous. We have had some changes to be made, but that's going very well. We are still going to go on with our keynote conversation for this morning. Yes, thank you so much for your cooperation back there. In a moment, I want to invite our speakers for the morning and our, uh, our, we're going to have a panel. So it's a panel conversation. But I want to remind you, we are here, and this is about the Kala program, which is an agro-led initiative with AMI as a leading implementer. We're here to discuss, to learn from those of us who are already doing lots of great things, but also to hear from those of us who have visibility that we may not have access to. So we are going to be having subject matter experts, policy makers, different categories of people who can speak into what we are doing so we can hopefully take it to the next level, all right? To get us started, um, I just want to remind you to kindly be flexible with some of the changes that we may have to work with. But before we get too far down, I want to ask us to get on our feet. If you could indulge me, please. Please rise to your feet right where you are. Okay, very good. Now I'd like you, um, we had this exercise yesterday and it was fantastic. I would like you to reach out to three people and just give them one compliment. Just three people, compliment them. The only requirement is that you have to do it while smiling. Otherwise, it can be confusing. <laughs> yes, there you go. I should put the other caveat as it had better be the truth. So don't, don't, don't tell a lie. If you don't like their tie, don't, uh, don't mention the tie. Okay, very good. Thank you so much for that. Fantastic. Now, the last thing I want to add to that, if you can hear me really clearly, is kindly greet someone in your mother tongue. Okay, greet someone in your mother tongue. We have over 10 countries, I believe, represented here across Africa, out from outside of Africa. How do you say good morning? in your mother tongue. Okay? This is getting a bit chaotic now. I love it. I see the cards are going by. Everyone is exchanging cards now. Okay, so this was supposed to be a one minute activity. Come back here, come. <laughs> come. All right, everyone. If I may get your attention again. Okay, good, good, good. Please have your seats. Uh, please have your seats. Have your seats. Okay. Without any further ado, I want to invite uh, us into our keynote conversation for this morning. And in order to do that, I'm going to invite our moderator. Ah. Shh. I need everyone to breathe in. Breathe out. Everyone, breathe in. Breathe out. Okay, so that's the attention I need from you for the next hour or so. Okay, um, it's going to be very interactive. Without any further ado, I'd like to invite a person who is very uh, special, very experienced, a senior in many ways. And even as I say this, I'm sure she'll say I'm adding pressure to the, to the role. But she is a recognized strategic communications professional with 18 plus years experience consulting globally in transport, agriculture, gaming, and manufacturing. She's the passionate leader who has won many awards, driving impact for top companies such as Kenya Airways, KLM, Deloitte and & Touche, and uh, so many others. She's a strategic thinker, and when I finish this intro, you had better clap, like, uh, you know, so, so she feels very special. She's a strategic thinker. She's driven by the opportunity to create shared value between organizations and the environment in development. 
implementation and evaluation of strategies, including but not limited to communications, sustainable development, and public policy. With an intro like that, she deserves the clap that you are going to give her. Her name is Jean Kerihari. She's going to come up and invite our panelists, and we'll get into this conversation. So what she'll also break down is that at some point we will transition, we'll have a mic that's roving. If you have a question that you'd like to ask, we will get into that. Another round of applause, please. Good morning. I think I'm vertically challenged. Give me a second here. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, at some point, I did not know whose profile he was reading, but um, thank you for that, and thank you for the drama that was around it. <laughs> um, good to meet you, Kala, um, delegates, um, distinguished guests, everybody who is here. Welcome. Um, here today we are going to discuss cultivating change, how we empower youth and women in Africa's food system transformation. And um, yesterday I met two very lovely people. I met them virtually, but I think we've created a rapport with that. And I think when I read their profiles, um, they'll join me up on stage. And you'll see whatever was read of mine is just a small shadow of what this distinguished people have achieved in life when it comes to agriculture, food systems, and leadership. So, Susan, allow me. She told me to call her Susan, but when you hear this, um, I, I think um, we'll all be humble as to what you have achieved, Dr. Tari. So, Dr. Susan Carrier, she's a director of African Women in Agriculture Research and Development. And I'm sure she's going to tell us more about that when she comes up here. She has more than 20 years of experience in international development, working with a range of organizations on gender equality and women's empowerment. Dr. Carrier has previously worked with food and ag, the FAO, I think we all know what FAO is, Ford Foundation, International Center for Tropical Agriculture. She holds a PhD in natural resource economics from the University of Minnesota and a master's degree in agriculture economics for Iowa State University. I think, Susan, please start making your way up. And I'm not done. I think she's, she, she, she has really studied um, quite a bit, and I, that's just half of it. So as she walks up here, please also acknowledge that she has a bachelor's degree in agriculture from the University of Eastern Africa in Kenya. So a big hand for Dr. Carrier, please. Are you ready, Ed? Good? All right. Now, this is Professor Ed Babaya. He doesn't like being called Professor. He prefers being called Ed, but I don't know um, about that. You will tell me after I've read his profile to you. So, Professor Ed Mabaya is a scholar and a development practitioner with more than two decades of experience working on development, agribusiness value chains, and food security issues in Africa, and I think beyond Ed, yeah? He's a research professor in the Department of Global Development at Cornell University and a director of Cornell University's Humphrey Fellowship Program. His teaching, research, and outreach work focuses on food security and economic development in Africa. I think Ed, maybe start walking up so people can put a face to all these great accomplishments. So previously, he was division manager of agribusiness development at the ADB, we all do it as Africa Development Bank, where he managed continent-wide investment, partnership, and research in support of the Feed Africa strategy. He is the former president of African Association of Agriculture Economists, and the, he has also earned the Archbishop Desmond Tutu Leadership Fellow Award. So another big, big hand to Professor Ed. So cultivating change and empowering youth and women in Africa's food system transformation. I'm actually very pleased uh, when I saw um, your color delegates walking in because I think this is a fair representation of both youth and women. And talking to many of you, I think you're 
actually embodied what we want to do in terms of taking the lead in Africa when it comes to food systems. Yes, I work for Agra, and one of our strong, strong beliefs is that Africa has its own solutions to solve its own problems. So and I think that's why you're here, and that's why you've also been enrolled in this program. I will take a seat now, and maybe we can start our conversation. Yes. <laughs> Test one, two? All right. Thank you once again. Um, I will start with um, Susan. And I think when we were talking yesterday, what inspired me when we talked, to you, when we talked together was how you address um, your leadership journey and what you have achieved when it comes to ag and food systems. But I think my first question to you is just to give us um, an idea um, what the priorities um, in terms of food systems are to you, what should we do? What are the gaps? And really, tell us more a little about what this term that is used a lot in East Africa, what are the irreducible minimums that we need to address when it comes to progressing food systems in Africa? Okay, thank you, thank you so much, um, Jean, and thank you for your kind introduction. <laughs> Uh, so, my name is Susan Carrier, and uh, I'm the director for our ward. Uh, before I, and first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. It's such a pleasure to meet, uh, to see the Kala uh, Fellows. Um, last year we attended the, I think you had a reception in the evening, but we never got a chance to really interact. So I'm really happy that we are happy to do this. So before I answer your question, I thought, uh, let me, allow me to tell you a little bit about AWARD. So AWARD, the African Women in Agriculture Research and Development uh, Organization, is a program that hosted at C4 ECRAF, and it was founded as a career development fellowship that sought to widen the pipeline of capable, confident, influential African women scientists in leadership in the agriculture research and development sector in Africa. And why was this important? We are responding to what, what we see often, the underrepresentation of women in the, in the agriculture research for development. It's a phenomenon that's called the leaky pipeline. Um, and we know that female, pro, female participation usually drops often with career progression in the science fields also in the agriculture fields, and this is due to mainly workplace, societal, and cultural challenges. So to address these challenges, award developed and delivers uh, tailored career development workshops or training. Um, and we train African women researchers in leadership, in science skills. We have a very robust mentoring program, but also thinking about ways to increase the visibility and, and access to the networks. And we, we've really seen a lot of progress. To date, we've actually reached about 1,700 African researchers, a few of them men, um, and we've actually reached over 7,000 uh, people in Africa that we've trained and globally. So when you ask me, what are the top priorities for the inclusive transformation of African food systems. Jean, I know, you know what I'm going to say. I'm going to say it's a gender gap in women's leadership in food systems organizations. And it's a gap in terms of their leadership, in terms of their participation, and in terms of even as researchers. And let, let me give you a few figures, because I think sometimes it's important that we back what we are saying with some figures. So, uh, for the last two years, UN Women, IFPRI, and a, an organization called the Global Health 5050 have been putting together a report. It's called the Global Food 5050. And, uh, the and the idea really is to look 
to analyze how these organizations are integrating gender considerations in their policies and in their practices. And it gets organizations such as FAO, WFP, CARE, all these global ag food and ag institutions to, to answer questions and then they analyze and they are looking at, you know, what are, what are the inequalities in their organizations? What are the pathways for career progression for women? Mm -hmm. And the last year's statistics said, first of all, and I'm talking to you here as Africans, huh? when you look at organizations, those global organizations, the first thing is there is gender and diversity is lacking, gender equality and diversity in the management is lacking. So the study found that gender and geographic diversity are severely lacking in the boards of the major global food organizations, uh, with leadership positions mostly dominated by people from the global north. Mm. If you look at those boards, just 8% of the board seats are held by women from low and middle income countries. Second, if you look at the senior management, only half of those organizations have yet to achieve gender parity in their leadership role. About 30% of them had more than two-thirds men in the management positions. And 30% of them had fewer than one-third women represented in their senior management. When you look, so if you want to address such a problem, you need to look at the policies of the institutions. And when you look at the institution's policies, you find that many are gender blind. They don't have policies for recruiting, retaining, and promoting women. So the study found only 16% had, okay, no, only 18% had said they were committed to gender equality, but there was no measures in place. So again, this is perpetuating that challenge. And finally, the, the, the other final thing that they found was a lack of gender parity amongst researchers, scientists, and technical officers. And this statistic, actually, that I have is from African, African research organizations. And it says that, um, on average, the percentage of women in agricultural research in African institutions stands at about 24%, and the leadership, 7%. These statistics, I think, affect all of you who are sitting in here, because the people I've met, many of you are researchers as well, yeah? And actually, these statistics mirror ministries of agriculture. They mirror all other areas uh, within the agriculture research for development. So this, for me, is a big challenge that we need to address. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, yeah. I, I'll, I think um, I, I'll just move to, to Prof because I think he's itching to say something and he loves conversation. And we talked about g uh, gender parity yesterday. Um, he was quite um, engaged. But I think, and I, this thing of moving, I'm going to get whiplash, <laughs> but let me do it. Yes, uh -huh. I'm back to you. So we've, we've heard very well and very eloquently from yeah. um, Susan here about um, gender parity mm. and inclusivity. But are you able to speak to now how do you think we are performing in terms of representation of the youth when it comes to the progression of, of food systems in this continent? Okay. First of all, it's quite an honor to be here and to be among this very distinguished uh, panel here. Um, my name is Ed Mabaya. I'm from Zimbabwe. You can call me Mgalim Ed. I that's what they call teacher in Tanzania. Uh, so let me just start off with a, a very short story that happened to me yesterday. I almost had my Damascus moment at the airport. So I arrived at the International Julius Nyerere International Airport yesterday, and I was going through the regular immigration procedures. I gave the guy my passport. First of all, it's a beautiful airport. Gave him my passport, started asking me the regular questions, who are you? What are you here to do? How long are you going to be in this country? And I said, you know, I'm at attending the AGRF meetings. And then the guy says uh, to me, what is AGRF? Several people have been coming here telling me they're going to AGRF. What is this AGRF? And I was like, oh, it's a good question. It's actually a convening of key thinkers 
around food security in agriculture in Africa. It's been happening for a while. And he said, well, is it the first time it's happening in Tanzania? And they said, I believe this is the first time. I've gone to several of them. I've never really been one here in uh, Tanzania. And he said, so what actually are you trying to do at this meeting? And they said, we're trying to feed Africa, make sure people don't go to bed hungry. Then the guy paused for a while and he said, but are you serious? I was like, what? Is this an immigration question now, or what is this? He said, yes, are you serious about this thing? He said, are you just here to talk, collect per diems, and go back to your countries? <laughs> I paused for a while. I actually looked behind me to see if I was being filmed or recorded. <laughs> then I realized he was serious about this question, and I needed to address it. So I looked at the guy, and I said, look, I can't speak on behalf of everybody who is here. But let me tell you something. This topic I'm talking about is as serious as death to me. I told him that Africa has about 20% children who are stunted. 20%. It's got more than 600, uh, you know, about one in five Africans go to bed hungry. An estimated 140 million people in Africa face food insecurity. If there's something that we can consider serious, it would be that. He looked at me, shook his head, and stamped my passport and said, good luck. <laughs> so here I am, having serious conversations. <laughs> so let me just also wanted to touch on, you know, I'll get into the youth, uh, youth issue in a little bit, but I wanted to touch a little bit on what I would consider some of the key priorities. Uh, key priority. I hope you guys can hear us back there. I don't know if, you know, oh, all right. The key priorities, being in academia, I've done and development practice, I've, there's so much. One could write books on what is needed to get Africa agriculture food security moving. There's so many things, and in every country they differ, and they also change. They're not the same things that were then 10 years ago. But if I was to select for me the top three priorities, uh, it would be three key things. One would be investment. Africa needs investment in agriculture in a very big, major way. We did an ASSR report last year, and we say that Africa needs about $80 billion of public sector funding and an estimated $170 billion in private sector funding. These are big numbers, and we can't get moving until and unless we have some of that. That needs to be invested in infrastructure, research and development, and all, all the other kind of things. The second thing I think is that we can all agree here that Africa needs to invest in productivity enhancing technologies. We cannot continue to produce the same little one cage, one ton per hectare on a unit of land against a growing population. We need to be able to use that land to produce more. So productivity enhancing technologies are going to be very vital. And third and last would be supporting the smallholder farmer in rural areas. Now, I don't know about you, but I grew up in the rural areas of Zimbabwe. There's nothing else to do there. You can't open a coffee shop. The only thing you can do is agriculture. Every parent is growing fruits, vegetables, maize, so that they can take their kids to school, so that their kids can have a better life than they have. So to me, if we can look at investing in these three, in increasing research and uh, development, productivity enhancing technologies, and investing in our rural farmers, we would be on our way to feeding ourselves as a continent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ed. I'll just hold you there a bit, um, and especially drawing from mm. your experience at the airport and that yeah. reaction that you got. Yeah. And I think one of the things all of us, well, the three of us are really precious about is trying to transform and get people more into progressive agriculture. Mm -hmm. And my question is, why do you think you got that um, um, reaction and from my experience is possibly the way we have positioned agriculture yeah. and also having the similar conversation especially working with youth who are not in agriculture and trying to bring them on board um, for them it's no I don't get my hands dirty I don't want to take a whole agenda and go to the farm it is 
um, a, a, a poverty trade, so mm -hmm. to speak. It's the way it's being positioned. So, mm -hmm. and especially when it comes mm -hmm. to youth, and I'm still holding you to that youth yeah. question yes. mm -hmm. <laughs> that I would like you to address. What do you think um, um, yeah. um, is, is draws that reaction and that yeah. hesitation? And maybe uh -huh. you can also answer when it comes yeah. to yeah. your area. Um, why aren't we progressing? Yes, we are saying we yeah. need to change. We need a change. That's why we are yeah. seated here. We are talking about yeah. it. But what is that thing that yeah. triggers such? I, I love that question. Maybe it's a good opportunity for me to get to the youth question. You know, 70% of Africa's population is above the age, below the age of uh, 35. Can you hear me well? Let that sink in for a little bit. 70% of Africa's population is below the age of 35. So we're very much a youthful population, right? We are the only place in the world that still has what we call a population pyramid. This means that it's narrow at the top and it's big and at the bottom. Most parts of the world now, it's almost inverted, that pyramid. So we cannot talk about developing and feeding a continent without talking about what the role of the youth is going to be. And the youth, by the way, do not consider agriculture profitable, most of them. What can we do about that? Indeed, like I said earlier on, the dream of every parent, if you're in rural areas, is to raise your kid so that they can leave the countryside and go and do something else. So there's something wrong when you have a continent with 70% of its population youthful, and that population does not want to be in agriculture. What do we need to do? We need to transform agriculture from, for it to be a profitable venture enterprise. Young people want the same things as young people around the world. These are kids who are on TikTok, on Facebook. They want to drive good cars. They want to have TVs. They want to have all these luxuries that we're used to. If agriculture was giving them that, they would be going there. What do we need to unlock that kind of demographic dividend is that we need to make agriculture profitable. We need to turn it from farming, I like to use this term, from agriculture to agribusiness. Agriculture means you are just doing this as a culture. It's what you have done and your parents before you. But business means that we are finding a way to make money out of this enterprise. There are so many ways to do that, including training programs, uh, access to credit and financing, uh, education, market linkage, all these things that can draw in the youth and help them, to, you know, convert them actually from a, polit a risk in most countries. The youth are considered a risk to what we would consider a demographic dividend. So these are just a few of the steps that I think we could start talking about. And within that youth, by the way, I'm glad my, my good friend Susan is talking about women because of that youth, there's also women. So if you talk about women and the youth, of that 70%, 35% of them are girls. So we need to be able to actually touch these groups together. If we can connect women and, uh, you know, uh, and uh, youth, the, the old museum men like me can step aside and we can make way for these two groups to make progress uh, where we, you know, yeah. things have not worked. Thanks. Yes, you may. Um, thank you so much, Ed, for adding the women to your <laughs> sentence. But actually, what I wanted to say is, yes, I, I really like what you say about making sure that we make um, agriculture more attractive for youth. There, there was a young woman who stood at a, a meeting I was, and you know we'd been showing all these tired-looking people with the gem, mm -hmm. and she she challenged us, and she said, "How do you expect me mm -hmm. to find this an attractive place to be if these are the kinds of pictures?" So even our communications yeah. is really important. Okay. And then finally, just to mention that when when we look at youth, it's really important that we recognize that young women face different challenges from young men. Many of these young women at 18, 19, 20, they're already mothers. So whatever interventions you, you have, don't, don't generically say youth. I think it's important that you differentiate the constraints, the specific constraints and opportunities for young women versus young men. Thank you.
Thank you for that. Um, and I, I agree on what is our role as players in the industry? What is the role of other people? And I do hope when we go to plenary, there's some members of the media who can also um, um, answer that question. How are we positioning agriculture and food systems so that it is more attractive, as Ed here has said? Mm -hmm. I'll come back to you. There's one part of my question you didn't answer before we move to um, the collaborative bit is, Yes, you did highlight the, the issues, gender parity and everything, but what is the one or two things, and I hope I was being told my mic isn't working. It's echoing. <laughs> Irreducible minimum, Susan, in terms of parity. What is the one or two thing? Yeah. What can we do? One or two things? Yes. What if there are more than one or two, Jane? Irreducible minimums, one or two. Just prioritize. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I, I want to say why, before I answer your one or two, I want to explain why it's important that we think about promoting women's leadership in these organizations. So Ed talked about the three, investment in ag, productivity enhancing technology, supporting smallholders. If we forget the gender equation in there, then we are not developing technologies that meet these women's needs. We are not, so they cannot adopt them, we are not supporting them. So we really must think of the gender e equation in all ways. It's in the technologies you develop, but it's also in the people who are working on those innovations, and it's in making sure that the research is actually paying attention to their, co to their constraints. So let me, I think for me, I go back to how do we make sure that we have women in leadership positions in these organizations. And for me, that's a key important aspect. And I'll tell you, a couple of years ago, about two years ago, one of the UN agencies in Rome um, needed to recruit African directors because they had lost the, the directors in the Africa region. So they started a process of trying to identify and it turned out there were no women at, you know, the P5 level is where, you, in, in the UN, when you're a P5, then you can become a director, like a D1 or a D2. And there were no P5, no D1s in the organization. And the executive director had to make a real decision to bring up a new cadre of women so that in a few years, they'll be ready for leadership. This is what we talk about creating that pipeline. But why, what is even more important is when you bring these women to that senior level, how do you prepare them so that they are ready for that leadership? And this is where what has always worked. You have to give them leadership skills. They need to understand how to be good leaders, how to be influential, how to speak out in meetings, and how, how to manage even selling the organizations. If you can't do that, then you're very quickly undermined in these kinds of organizations, these international organizations. The second thing that award has always done is we've created a mentoring program, which is very much a part of the award fellowship. And our mentoring program links uh, our fellows with a more senior person who has more experience, more expertise, knows how to maneuver. What we have found is that this is a hugely important process for, for, organ, for really creating you as a leader. They help you answer questions, they work with you to figure out where do you want to go, what do you need to go to do that. And what we have found is that our mentoring programs are so powerful, even the mentors benefit as well as the mentees. And, uh, and I think these are some of the really, really important aspects in terms of moving women from uh, creating the influential women leaders who can be in the AR for this sector. Thank you. Thank you. And I love what you said about um, reverse mentorship. It's actually real. We, I have experienced it. Sometimes you have protégés who at times you have conversations now and they're the ones who are leading you as to what you should do and you know, what you should take up. So totally agreed on that point. Thank you so much, Susan. Ed, I'm back to you. Okay. You were very passionate yesterday when we spoke about collaborative. Oh. Yes. 
collaborative leadership. Yes. Um, yeah. Tell us a bit more about that in terms of your views and how and the role it plays in advancing our food systems. Yes, I hope this microphone is on. I'd like to switch sides and face the other side of the room as well. But that's a very beautiful question. It's actually one of my favorite African saying goes, um, if you want to travel far, fast, you go alone, but if you want to go far, we have to go together. I'll repeat it again. If you want to go fast, you go by yourself. But if you want to go far, you have to travel with others. I think it's South African in origin. To me, the journey with trying to travel here is long distance. This is a marathon, it's not a sprint. Therefore, it requires strong collaboration and partnership. What do I mean by that is, you have several players here, and maybe let me just put in a plug here on behalf of Agra, that the role of this AGRF is really to co create a space where we can meet and start collaborating. We can't do it, fine, you can do it via Zoom, but it's much better to do it in person, right? <laughs> so to me, it's vital that whatever we are doing requires, there's not going to be one person that solves Africa's food security and agricultural challenges. It requires government and public sector with good policies. It requires private sector coming in with investments and money. It requires research and development the CG centers, universities, like myself included there. It requires civic organizations, NGOs that are out there doing the hard work. But most importantly, it requires the farmer themselves, he or she. Can I have a show of hands how many people here are farmers? That's often, wow, oh, I like this. I think 10 years ago when I came to AGRF, this question would have been answered differently. I'm real, I'm happy that we're having farmers in the room because they're a key part of the constituency as well. So it requires all these partners to be together, coming in and co-creating solutions and actually uh, creating synergy through these uh, kind of arrangements. When I was at African Development Bank, I used to work on a program called Enable Youth. And with that, we tried to get more young people into agriculture. We worked with government, we worked with commercial banks, we worked with local NGOs, training universities, and all that. It took a while to get these people together. Why it's challenging is that these people often don't speak the same language. You go to governments, they want to talk about policy and regulations and laws, what you cannot do. You go to private sector, they're asking you about rate of return on investment. How much money can we make here? You go to you know, civic organizations, they have a very narrow and specific mandate, some of them. Researchers, some of them just want to publish papers. So you have to get them into one room and say, by the way, the goal that we are in pursuit of, the true north, is the same. We are all trying to get, make sure that nobody goes to bed hungry. Then you bring in, what do you have to bring to the table? So I want us, as we are here, as leaders, I'm going to throw out a challenge out there. Make five unique contacts from this meeting that you're going to follow up with after this. This is how collaboration happens. This is how networking happens. Don't just be here to enjoy yourself. Make it matter that you're here in person and meet and collaborate with other partners. How about that? Super. Super, thank you so much, Ed. Um, you are nodding a lot and saying, mm, mm, quite a bit. <laughs> I think you have something to say about collaborative leadership, Susan. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yesterday, when we discussed this, I said, I'll let the professor answer the collaborative. Now, I do this a lot, so. <laughs> no, but um, no, I totally agree with Ed, and I. I really, really like his challenge to you um, because it's amazing the kinds of contacts you meet in a place like this and what they can do for you in your future. I actually remember attending, when I was a young PhD student, I attended a meeting, it was called the Salzburg Seminar in Austria. And the contacts I made there made the biggest difference in my professional career. There are people I collaborated with later. There are people who 
actually called me to attend meetings in the future. There are people who sponsored my studies and my projects. So it is really, really important that you make the contacts and also follow up because this is where you can make amazing contacts. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Susan. I'm still sticking with you, and now I want to get a bit personal. <laughs> yes, I'd like you to give us, just uh, before we go to plenary, a personal experience that you've had in this whole journey that you've taken, your fantastic career in food systems and ag, in terms of your biggest challenge. What has propelled you to keep going on with this? What has been the biggest lesson or a big lesson, an important lesson that you have actually learned in your journey? And that I'll come to you. I think you have the advantage to think about it, but it might be at the tip of your, your tongue right now. But here we go, Susan. Jean, you were going to throw in a spanner, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my biggest, I think my biggest challenge was um, when I finished my PhD, I, had, I got a fellowship at uh, the Rockefeller Foundation in New York. At the time, they had a fellowship called the Warren Weaver Fellowship, long, long, long ago. The, it's now closed. But anyway, so it was an excellent opportunity. I went to New York and in the, in the Rockefeller Foundation offices. And I, I had not a great experience. It was an experience that made me question myself and my own validity and, and what really helped me at that time was what I've been saying. Find a mentor, a mentor who always supports you, who understands you, and who helps you through these journeys. And I remember calling my mentor, and my mentor was in Malawi at the time. I called her, I said, Susan, am, am I a good, you know, am I qualified for what I'm doing? And she said, yes, keep at it, keep going. Here are different options to solve that problem. So having a mentor and having these peers that you can call on to help you at different moments, I think have been the most important in my life. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, thank you, Susan. I think we've, in one way or the other, been there. It's a bit of self-doubt, but it helps to have those mentors here with us. Ed, what keeps you in the game? Oh, that's a very good and important question, actually. At some point in my life when I was, you know, I still don't know what I want to do when I grow up. I'm that kind of person that thinks like that, that I'm young at heart. But they realize that um, if you look at the biggest challenges facing the African continent, there's no way that uh, food and agriculture, food security, would not be among your top five priorities. We hear the numbers all the time, number of millions of people going to bed hungry, number of standard children. After a while, you hear these things, they almost lose meaning. You hear them in reports, you see them on TV. I go back to my village almost every year, and I meet people, including my own classmates, who are still struggling to put that meal on the table. These are not mere numbers out there. And they challenge you, when you're getting tired of this profession, working this field, go out there to rural Malawi and meet Miss Banda with the two daughters who are struggling to put food on the table that night. That should give you that passion and drive to say this is more than just a cause on a piece of paper. These are livelihoods that we're trying to impact. Let that answer the question that I started off with when asked, are you serious? The question that I was asked at immigration, that's how serious it is, that there are people out there who are counting on the outcomes of this meeting here, the people that are sitting here, what they decide and what they do is going to determine lives for these people and their children as well. They're counting on us, and that's what gives me that drive sometimes when I can't get out of bed. Wow, thank you, Ed. And as we said when we started, we have the solutions right mm. here. We mm. have our solutions through this Food Systems Forum, Africa-led solutions. That's what keeps us in the game. So um, I think we have time now to go to plenary and take some questions from our attendees. So we have the, the mics, yes. Thank, thank you. you. 
Thank you, so, Jeans. So we have two microphones. We have one over yep. there, that's Reshma Thank waving. You. And over this end, I'll be here. So we'll take, can we take four questions as you maybe take a note and then we respond Sounds to good. them? Now, um, kindly some directions. I'm going to try to work with the body language I've been practicing. If you hold the microphone and I start to move really close to you, I'm saying something. <laughs> Just let's keep it really simple and short. Okay, so please raise your hand if you have a question and also one. keep it brief so we can get that answer. This one here. Um, my name is Tontoza Uganda, and I'm just going to try to keep it brief. You talked about investments in agriculture being one If of you could please just speak up on the mic, yeah. Uh, my name is Tontoza Uganda, and one of the key issues you talked about was investments in agriculture. And I understand that you're working with the youth. How exactly did you come up with uh, a strategy that ensures that that investment goes to the youth? Thank you. Mm. All right, we'll take another question. Yes, please. Thank you very much. It's really interesting to hear, especially like from agriculture to agribusiness. Thank you so much. It's really catching. And uh, uh, my question is going for Dr. Susan. This is Masarat from Ethiopia. I was thinking about you were saying there was 7% females in the Agricultural Research Institute on the leadership position. And I really want to hear like, have you have we really seen like a difference on the way that these institutes are actually implementing their programs? Because you said the role models they are influencing the other women, but are we really seeing ground level changes for the women who are like on the agriculture sector and like those are disadvantaged? All right. Thank All right, you. That's two. Let's take two more. Um, two gentlemen, maybe we've had two ladies, so. At the back. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I have two comments. One goes to Dr. Bayer. Is it, is it possible to have it one so we can yeah, have a bit? No, they're more very in. quick. All right, thank you. Dr. Bayer, the question you are asked at the airport serves us right, all of us here. Because we come from here with information, we don't pass it back to that small farmer at the village. So they think we are not serious. The second one is to Susan. Susan, the equation of gender in agriculture is purely blamed on you women because you don't really mentor your young women. You leave them far back. So these are the things that need to be done. Thank you so much. Thank you for the comments. Areshma will take one more from the far side, and then we'll come to our panel. I'm going to kindly request, as respectfully, we'll try to cover as much ground with those. If we can take some more questions, that would be great. Uh, one last one, and then we'll respond. Thank you. Uh, all right, thank you so much. My name is Triana from uh, Malawi. Um, still on the investments, um, agricultural investments, I wanted to find out in terms of the strategies on how you include the youth. I'm actually coming from a background where the youth do not have um, startup capital. They don't yeah. have land. They don't have um, the resources to start even an agribusiness. Uh, we are talking about a youth that is between the age range 18 to 35. Right. How do we then target someone who is between 20, 21, 22, mm. who completely has nothing as, um, as a startup? Thank you. Thank you so much. Over to you, Jane. Good. Thank you. Um, I think we had the questions, but as a fair split, um, mm. Ed, if you could take the questions on investment in ag, I think mm. there's a similarity there on how yeah. um, youth can access finance um, mm -hmm. in investments. Then there was a question on um, the difference and how the programs have been implemented. Have you seen that difference in between, um, from when you started until now during your career? I think, Susan, you can take that one. Plus the question on women mentorship. <laughs> do we mentor our young women, Susan? Um, or is there a gap or can we do more? And then um, back to you, um, Ed. Um, information to the smallholder farmer. I think mm -hmm. there was a question there is, um, we do so much, but how are we disseminating information 
um, to them? Or are we just doing this in isolation and working in silos? So may we start with you? Thank you. Thank, thank you so much uh, for the question. So before I joined the ward, I was working at uh, the FAO and I was leading the gender work at FAO. Uh, I joined FAO in 2013 and I left in 2021. The change I have seen even at FAO in those years is tremendous. When I first joined, we could not push and say, gender is important, put it in the strategy. We would be pushed, you know, there would be so much pushback. By the time I left FAO, the new strategy has gender as a specific technical area and as cross-cutting theme. The CGIAR, same, it has gender as a cross-cutting theme and gender as a technical area. So th there's growing, growing recognition of the importance of gender equality uh, in, in the ag sector. Um, and I've also seen lots of changes in the national organizations here in Africa as well, the NAS, the, the, the universities of agriculture. So there's been great change. I think what is important for us now is to keep pushing the agenda and to keep advancing. But I definitely see a huge, huge change. One of the things we want to do as a ward uh, going forward is the statistics I gave you are a little old. So we are hoping to do a new study in the, the next year or so to really update those figures, to see where we stand in terms of you know, women's leadership in the AR4D sector, and to also see in terms of researchers as well. So we'll be doing that study in the next year or so. Uh, to the question around are we mentoring our young women, I, I want to start off by saying, when you asked the question, you said, you, are you mentoring your girls? The truth is gender equality is about all of us. It's about men, women, fathers, mothers, etc. We all have a role to play in terms of gender equality, in terms of supporting our girls to be more confident, and we all have a, a role to play in changing the mindsets within our communities, within our homes. Because actually, let me say, many, many of us as parents, we actually even give different tasks to boys and girls. Yeah? This is where it starts. So we all have a role in terms of raising our girls to be confident, to be capable, to know they can do science. And this is what I would like to say. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to come back to you for your parting shot. Not just now, after Ed. Don't worry, Susan. <laughs> But thank you for that. Um, your questions are very quickly. Ed. Yes. Yeah. Very briefly, let me just start by picking off on that last question that Susan has made. That for the gentleman who asked the question about gender, I dare say she has to do with finesse. If you're not part of the solution of solving the gender inequity in Africa, you're probably part of the problem. I mean, let's just be honest here. This is a such a a theme that cuts across everything from health, education, agriculture, food. And if you see this as somebody else's problem, chances are you are probably stepping in the way. Sorry to have to put it that bluntly. Then to the question on investments. There were two questions asked about how much investment uh, is needed and how much of it should go to youth. Let me ask, start with the higher level answer. The reason we fight for how much goes to women, how much goes to youth, is that there's simply not enough investment in the sector overall. When the pie is small, it's easy for each party to see how, what is my slice here. We need to increase the overall investment size in food and agri-systems. The numbers I gave earlier, you know, 80 billion for government, 170 billion for private sector. These are huge staggering numbers. Once we get to closer to those numbers, you will see that the automatic transmission to women and youth will be almost, banks should not have to discriminate between those. That said, there are many fantastic efforts out there now that are specifically targeting women and youth. I know Mastercard Foundation, Agra, African Development Bank, they have very specific programs that are meant to target 
youth and young people. The last question on information for smallholder farmers. Yes, if we do our, our jobs well, then those people don't even need to know what we're discussing here. They see the outcomes through the changing livelihoods where they are. They don't read the communiques that go out of these meetings, but they're the ones that are actually impacted by that. So, and I'll also add here, now today with social media, the word is also going out there. So I think uh, we don't have to do much in terms of communication. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ed. Um, 30 seconds. I have even Contract. less, so don't <laughs> worry. I, I think my parting shot is that if we want to achieve inclusive food systems, it's going to be crucial that women are in the leadership positions and are part of the decision making in their households, in their communities, societies, and in policy processes. Thank you. 25 seconds, fantastic. <laughs> you have 35 seconds I now. Th thanks <laughs> for yielding the time. I'll say, for me, last night I was thinking of this question. As a teacher, Mwalimu, I thought, what is the best way to package this into an acronym? So I came up with the acronym SPEAR. We need SPEAR to fight food insecurity. SPEAR, S is for sustainability. We need to do it in a way it does not hurt the earth. B, P is for productivity. We need to enhance productivity on the same amount of land. E is for empowerment and inclusivity for women, youth, and children. A is for adaptation. We're chasing a movie target. We always need to modify ourselves. And R is for resilience to shocks. We're going to have conflict. We're going to get COVID. We need to continue to be able to do this despite all these challenges. So think of carrying your spear as you go out and tackle these issues. Thank you so much, Ed. Thank you. I forgot, um, yes, you're, you're also a teacher. So yeah, we have been school today. Thank you so much, Susan. Thank you so much, Ed. Plenary, Asante Nisana. I think we're all now way to cultivating change as we transform Africa's food systems. Thank you very much. And over to you. A big round of applause, please. Thank you. A bigger, bigger round of applause, please, if you will. Thank you so much. If you just came in in the middle of that conversation, that's our first keynote conversation for our time together, cultivating change, empowering youth and women in Africa's food systems transformation with our panelists. Uh, some of the key things I appreciated is the, in this journey, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. There's a very important role that mentoring plays and I like that uh, at the end of the day, it's our problem. We need to find what to do. Now, without any further ado, I'd like to do two things. One, just to remind us of the overarching purpose of why we're here. Kindly repeat after me. What's the first word? We're here to connect. Please repeat after me. Connect, collaborate, and contribute. One more time. Connect, collaborate, and make our contributions. If we connect, it does not guarantee that we are collaborating. So we have to be a lot more intentional. And then at the end of the day, we have to move to the fruit of contribution. Now, without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Apollos. And what's going to be happening in the next couple of minutes is we're going to get our official, official welcome. We have great people with us, and Apollos will be giving us the great honor of introducing the next couple of speakers uh, for our welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, we uh, appreciate the fact that, you know, we seem to have started well this morning. And thanks to uh, my friend and professor, uh, Ed and um, Susan, thank you for um, that very interesting and uh, insightful discussion. I thought it was really um, important. So I took away a few things. One of them I need to note is spare or spear, depending on how you choose to pronounce it. Um, uh, and uh, of course, I liked the R on resilience, um, uh, which is important if we're going to take an inclusive leadership to food systems transformation in the continent. And that's the theme for this leadership forum this year. We're very pleased that, um, you know, uh, quite a number of you who applied, you know, for uh, the leadership um, uh, program, you know, uh, that you are the ones who finally made it and got your admission 
So for the next 16 months, um, a lot of you will be going through different um, uh, sessions, you know, from, uh, from how you make decisions to addressing climate to issues from inclusion, you know, to as well as uh, looking at um, how you are able to mobilize investments to transform your food systems in your countries. So I think you should give yourselves a hand for making it through uh, to the Color Leadership Program. Today, um, you, you do have the privilege of hearing from a set of leaders who um, are well respected, not just within the continent, but globally. And they will be speaking to you shortly. I'm very pleased to you know, announce um, you know, um, these leaders who will be joining us here and will be sharing with you very insight insightful perspectives on food systems transformation and inclusive approach. First, I'd like to welcome you know, uh, somebody you all know. Some of you have only, <laughs> if I'll put it this way, um, heard her speak or seen her on the internet, but now she's here live. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome um, Dr. Agnes Kalibata, the president of AGRA. I would also like to welcome um, to the stage um, to please join us here, um, you know, uh, Professor Joachim von Braun, who is the chair, you know, um, of um, Professor Joachim von, von, von Braun is the chair um, of the Center for Development Research at Braun University, Germany. Welcome, Prof. And um, I would like to welcome Mr. Roy Stenner, who's the Senior Vice President for the Food Initiative at the Rockefeller Foundation. And I would also like to welcome, you know, um, a woman who is a great change maker in the continent, Ms. Ndidi Wuneli, who's the co-founder and executive chair of Sahel Consulting, as well as leading the Africa Food Change Makers. You're welcome, Mark. Great. Um, these four leaders will be sharing what I will consider as very golden insights. So I want you to take your notes. You probably might not have this opportunity for the rest of your 16 months here, you know, um, during the course of your leadership program. Um, but I'm very pleased to also um, welcome the chief executive of the Africa Management Institute, you know, who will be joining us here, a great friend and also a great woman, Miss Rebecca Harrison. Um, so thank you, uh, all of you, for being here. Um, without much ado, I just want to say that we will, we will go into a discussion, but first and foremost, I would like to kindly welcome Dr. Agnes Kalibata for her opening speech and to welcome you. She chairs the Center for African Leaders in Agriculture. Please. Good, morning, good afternoon. Yeah. Thank you, Apollos, for the introductory remarks. And let me start by apologizing that we actually shifted this session from morning to now, but we are extremely happy to be here to join you for this conversation. Oh, okay. Okay, no problem. Is this working? Is this working? Oh, very good. I'm here with my board just to tell you how seriously we take this. So the uh, delegates that um, Apollos has just introduced are board members of AGRA. And as you would know, AGRA is a critical founder of the Color Institute, as we call it today. Color is about leading in agriculture and finding leaders for African agriculture. So we are extremely happy and proud that you have decided to be part of this initiative. We started this initiative because we realized that uh, 
there was a disconnect in a number of places. The biggest disconnect was that the people that are farming today and the people that are basically living in the sector are not making it productive enough. They don't have what it takes to make that sector productive. And we many times refer to them as, oh, the people that are working are 60 years old. Have you heard that phrase being used a number of times? But the truth is, Africa is largely young people. And those young people are not anywhere coming to, uh, close to this area that is the source soul of our food, and in many cases, is a critical element of reducing poverty on our continent. The other truth is, many of you are already working in critical places, places that are important to impacting the sector. Whether you're working with the government, whether you're working with the private sector, or whether you're working leading a farm organization in the civil sector, you're already a critical part of what's going on, but you're disconnected from this whole leadership for ag that is going on and from the knowledge that is very critical to leading the sector. So we thought that maybe the first connection we need is to ensure that there's a direct link to the sector, that you have an opportunity to link with the sector. So that's number one. But the next other link you need is to connect with each other. As people that are leading within a country, whether you're leading in the private sector, you're leading in government, or you're leading in civil society, you're a leader and you need to connect and you need to speak the same language. And how do you get to speak the same language? You have to have conversations that are, are aligned around the same issues. You have to know each other. So we've done this and I was extremely excited to see how you people in color here are already beginning to solve problems together. When you bring someone in the government, a branch of government, and someone in the private sector, and someone working with farmers, and you're all working together on a problem, to resolve a problem together. That's what it should be. The other thing that I found really, really interesting is that until we got you to talk to each other and design that program together, you actually were coming from the same country, caring about the same things, worried about the same things, and you had never talked. So really, that's what color is about, that we give you a chance to connect. The other part of the connection is that you come from so many different countries, and you are exposed to so many different things, and this is an opportunity to learn and network. But you're also connected to the rest of us. Just think about how many people during this AGRF you'll be able to meet. Don't take that lightly. In the corridors there, in Africa, we call it the corridors of power. These are not the corridors of power, but these are the corridors of connection. In those corridors of connection, make sure that you connect. Make sure that you walk up to people and ask them how they can support you, how they can help you, how they can speak to your people, how they can tell you what is working differently. Support and help is not about money. It's about knowledge and information. Anybody who has more information than you has more power than you. So this is really the opportunity that color brings. Let's use it as that opportunity that helps shape the leaders of tomorrow, and that's the ultimate conversation here. Color was put in place to shape the leaders of tomorrow, to help you understand what's happening, where you're going, to help you start thinking about how you want to lead in that space how to lead with the private sector, how to work with the government better if you're in the private sector, and how to lead with farmers and work with farmers where everybody's a winner and where young people and old people and women and men have a seat and have the ability to have a conversation. So that was really the purpose and the hope that you're beginning to harness and see the opportunities for that. I want to conclude on one note. I want to thank the partners that saw that vision of color as an opportunity to bring Africa's leadership and African youth into leadership, the, uh, the government, the German government that funds this work through AGRA, BMZ, was the initial financier of this work, and we're extremely grateful to the support that we've gotten to get the first cohort, which is already graduated and out there working, and now the second cohort. Are we on the second or third cohort? Second. Third cohort, now the third cohort that is here. 
And I hope we're building a community of people out there that take leadership in their hands and understand the value of leading for the agricultural sector. I also want to thank uh, our other partners, the Rockefeller Foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and MasterCard Foundation, that see the opportunity to continue building uh, systems on this continent and continue building capacities that can help us to own our own narrative and own the leadership of the continent, starting with the agricultural sector. I want to thank Emma. I would not have been able to do this work without you. Emma has been our partner in getting color moving and getting color started. And you've done an amazing job, sir, and your team. And we're extremely grateful to the work that you've done. So with that, Apollos, I thank you for put, bringing this team here. And I want you to know that the whole ag ecosystem out there, we are really excited to have you joining us. And we want to know how we can support you and help you to be tomorrow's leaders in the ag sector. Leaders in public, leaders in private sector, and leaders in civil society where you are, with a vision to ensure that we can actually, as a continent, feed ourselves. So thank you again for being part of this call, and I look forward to these conversations. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kalibata, for that very inspiring opening remarks. You know, uh, one of the things that, you know, we know about leadership is the ability to inspire and to get people motivated to do what they should do. Thank you. And, and thank you that, you know, um, we do have, you know, your leadership in driving food systems. And this is just one of the many programs, you know, that um, AGRA is leading to drive that. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Rebecca Harrison to come and make a few opening remarks as well, you know, to welcome everyone from AMI, please. Welcome cohort two and cohort three. Um, it's wonderful to have you here. On behalf of AMI, I will be very brief um, we're really here as partners to AGRA um, and have this wonderful honor of journeying with you um, through the CALA Advanced Leadership Program. As you know, co Cohort 1 have already graduated. Cohort 2, it's great to have you back again. We met some of you last year. And Cohort 3, wonderful to welcome you here. Um, I loved what Sam said earlier. We're here to connect, to collaborate, and to contribute, and I think those are three fantastic verbs, doing words, <laughs> um, that capture what it is um, to be a leader and to be a leader on Kala. It captures what Kala is all about. Um, we're here to learn to be better leaders, to practice together in a safe space, being better leaders as we journey together, and to build a community of support that goes way beyond the Kala program. Um, so I'm really excited to be here today, and um, thank you, Apollos, for the introduction. Looking forward to um, getting into the meat of what it means to be an inclusive leader. Uh, we're going to have a great discussion today. Um, wish you well over the next few years. Um, thank you, Dr. Kalabata, for your um, inspiring remarks. Uh, really, Kala was Dr. Kalabata's um, vision and the inspiration that you always bring when you talk about Kala. I think it's really inspiring. Um, for all of us. So Kala leaders, welcome. We look forward to connecting, collaborating, and to your contribution this week and beyond, um, and looking forward to connecting with, you, with many of you over the next few days. Thank you so much. Right. Um, thank you, Rebecca. Uh, Sam, could you, do you mind sharing with me the, or the mic? Yeah. So we're going to go into a very interesting panel discussion within the next. Uh... Yeah. So we're going to go into a very interesting panel discussion, um, and um, uh, after which we will ask Professor Joachim von Braun to make 
a few closing remarks, um, and, and then we will be, uh, we will then uh, ask you, uh, I think my colleague, my colleagues, uh, Daniel and Brenda, will then invite you for lunch uh, uh, while we excuse uh, our distinguished guests who have decided to join us today. So thank you, um, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. Um, we will be asking you um, to share some of your insights, and we're going to start by asking, what does inclusive leadership mean for food systems transformation? Um, and I would like to start with uh, Ms. Ndidi Muneli, you know, on that question, uh, and then um, other panel members can also uh, give their insights from where you sit, what you think, um, uh, you know, about uh, what, what inclusive leadership means for food systems transformation. Thank you very much, and congratulations to Dr. Kalibata and Apollos for another class. I know that some of my colleagues have benefited immensely from Kala. Temi Adegoro, a managing partner, was a Kala graduate, so I've seen firsthand the impacts of Kala. So well done to you and your team. Thank you. Now, for me, inclusive leadership in food and ag means that no one is left behind. Um, and that is tough, right? The realities in our ecosystem at the moment is that there's tremendous inequity. Who suffers most when we're not inclusive? The most vulnerable, children, the elderly, women. Um, and in our ecosystem, we see the statistics and they're glaring. And in West Africa right now, we're facing an immense food crisis. In Nigeria, those who are from Nigeria in the audience know that food prices have doubled in the last six months. And so we're down to zero, one, zero. And who pays the price when there's poor leadership or lack of leadership or an absence of leadership? The women go hungry, the children go hungry, the elderly go hungry first. When there's only one meat in the pot, who gets the meat? The men. I grew up in a home where my father always got three pieces of meat and then we got one each. And this is an, a professor. My father is a professor, okay? So you can understand the cultural nuances associated with growing up in a home that has a priority for men. And I always, as, the more I learned about nutrition, I realized men should not be getting meat. In fact, you don't need meat when you're a man. The children need the meat. So what do we need to change in our system? First, we need to ensure that we create a level playing field. And I'm a big believer in quotas. We need quotas. We need explicit quotas when it comes to leadership. And we need gender equity. We need quotas for young voices in the room. We need quotas for the elderly who are now being discriminated against. We need quotas for people with physical and mental challenges. And I realize that if we don't explicitly set targets for quotas, we will continue to leave people behind. And when you're not in the room, your voice is not heard and your decisions cannot be made, decisions cannot be made that favor you. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that we really need to ensure a inclusive lens with every policy decision that's made in our ecosystem. And I've realized that we take it for granted that we understand what it means to have an inclusive lens. But I've been partnering with agencies who have taught us that when you read documents and you say, let me change my lens and say, I'm going to look at this document and this policy from the lens of a young person or from the lens of a, a woman or from the lens of an elderly, then you start seeing the language that already discriminates and their unconscious biases, and we need to have that lens and actually hold ourselves accountable to have an inclusive lens with every policy, with every program, and with implementation. Because if we don't, we continue to leave people behind. And then the third thing around inclusive ecosystem leadership, and for you who cut across a wide spectrum, is that it's not, a, it's not just the preview of the private sector, civil society, and public sector, but it's also faith-based organizations. I realized in Africa, and I always talk about the power of faith-based organizations, we're deeply religious, either Muslim, Christian, something. And across the board, ecosystems that affect us and food is paramount, need to have a wide spectrum where we say who are the key stakeholders and what institutions need to change to be inclusive. Our faith-based organizations need to be inclusive, right? Because they govern a lot of the cultural nuances. Our traditional institutions need to be inclusive, and it walks across the board. So I could talk about this forever, but this is a very important issue, and I'm so glad we're having this discussion today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ndidi. I would like to 
Okay. Yes, please. Please go ahead. Is it, is it me? <laughs> <laughs> Great, I'll, I'll jump in. Well, my, my vision of inclusive leadership is actually in Didi, so we have a great example here. But I am so glad to be talking with all of you as leaders because um, I'm sorry to say this, but I think the next 10, 10 to 20 years are going to be the most challenging humanity has ever faced, and it's going to need people like you to actually lead us through that really difficult time. We're going to be facing so many issues around climate change and polarization that that need to be dealt. You know, when it comes to inclusive leadership, uh, it, um, the image, the lesson I learned maybe, oh, was, I hate to, I'm so old, but it's 20, 25 years ago, we were leading a participatory breeding program for beans, and we had um, a, a group that was evaluating beans that were all men, and then a group that were, was a mix of men and women, and they chose completely different varieties. Turns out the men, all they cared about was yield, but the women really wanted to understand cooking time because that took so much longer time. And, and, and when you think about, if you don't have women in that room, or, or a part of the decision process, you end up with a, with, with a variety that never gets adopted because people just don't use it. Um, I think that's, going, that's the case in so many situations in food systems. If we're not listening to the full spectrum of opinions, we're going to choose, make decisions that are not good for the overall system and don't work. And we already know, for example, when I did my PhD, um, we were really believed in a model of, you know, basically monocultures with like high inputs, uh, which we now know are, is not a climate smart, climate resilient. Monocultures with high dependence on fossil fuel derived uh, inputs needs to, needs to change to one that is, can use some of that, but needs to be more polycultures, more uh, regenerative approaches, which are often actually some traditional practices. So we need to combine the science of today with the traditional practice of the past to develop climate resilient, climate uh, forward uh, systems. They're not the systems that I learned were the, the, the way uh, we, were, we were supposed to have. And that can only happen if we have inclusion. We need to have the youth to come in to help us determine what, uh, what's a lot of the tech forward work, but also listen to the elderly and the people who have this deep wisdom of the land that we often ignore. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it. One last thing is I'm so glad we're talking about systems because so often we, pull, we, we, we uh, divide up, and that also creates a really uh, non-optimal solution. We need to understand how everything connects. Uh, my father, uh, who passed a, a couple years ago, he was a very devout Baha'i and would always tell me this beautiful Baha'i quote, which is, so powerful is the light of unity that it can illuminate the whole earth. And I think, uh, you as leaders can provide the light of unity to illuminate all of Africa uh, because only by understanding how we're all interconnected and how we're connected with the land, how we're connected to future generations, can we create the kind of food system we need. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. I'm going to go ahead to ask Professor Von Brown and Dr. Kalibata, what does, how would you describe an inclusive food system? And particularly for you, Dr. Kalibata, what's your perspective, seeing that you're leading um, an institution that is driving food systems in Africa? Uh, so I'll start with Professor Von Brown, please. Thank you. It's, uh, it's my pleasure to address this uh, group of uh, leaders uh, who are already leaders and leaders to come. An inclusive food system requires leaders who think inclusively, who know their business, who understand that agriculture and food are complex technical issues. I, by the way, like your three C's, the connect. The connect needs to also include connecting to science because you cannot lead without knowing better without knowing best. 
the inclusive food system we talk about, but we also talk about food systems transformation. That's a process in which things change. So you need to stay on top of things that change while maintaining your vision. The sustainable agricultural food system serving people and nature, end of hunger, improved nutrition. Those are the key visions. So the, the task before you as, as leaders in that is you make some choices. As leaders, you don't need always to be leading from front. You can also lead from behind. The shepherd walk, walking behind the herd, guiding. So don't, don't necessarily have the ambition to lead from front. Use the new communications tool. I add a C to your three Cs. I hope some of you become um, so-called influencers. Influencers for food and agriculture transformation using YouTube and so on. And I have a last little point. Don't shy away from the problem of loneliness in leadership. Yes, you want to connect, but uh, as leaders, you have to also make decisions. And sometimes you are lonely. You are not dictatorial, but tough decisions require also that leaders are bold enough to guide the food systems transformation. So connect to science in order to be on top of things. Use the new digital tools. Maintain your vision and connect between business, public sector, government, and uh, civil society. And you will be great collectively and individually. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Dr. Kalibata. Thank you. Um, maybe the only thing I can add to what has been said is um, inclusion is about intentionality. It's, it's about doing things like you mean them. You know, we, we've been doing or talking about inclusion, especially around gender, for a very long time. But many times when you look at the data we have, you ask yourself whether we've just been ticking boxes or we've actually been including women as we should. So even as we go to this journey, additional journey of including young people in leadership, is it going to be ticking boxes, or is it going to be actually doing it? So, and doing things means that we understand why they are not happening. It means that we understand the gaps, the market failures, and we become very intentional in fixing those gaps. If it is about fewer women in the engineering field, for example, what do you do to get women there? It's not about, no, we need to get women there. If it is about fewer women that access good seed, because they don't come from their homes to come to the meetings where seeds are being distributed <coughs> or talked about, what do you do to fund them and make sure that they access these things? So I think the extra mile that is, in, is needed to get things done, to get inclusion to happen, at all levels of where inclusion needs to happen is probably the most important thing. That we think through that and we put in plans, in place plans to actually ensure that we get to do what we say we'll do. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kalibata. I was going to ask you, uh, Rebecca, what, what, do, what do you think are the tools that can be used to drive and support inclusive leadership? 
Thank you so much. There's so much to say on this topic, and I loved what um, Professor Edwards said earlier around, um, you, you said, Professor, if you're not part of solving the inclusivity challenge, then you're part of the problem. Um, and, and I think that's what you're saying as well, Dr. Kalabata. What can we do as individuals? So we often talk at AMI about, and, and Cala delegates, you will have heard this, um, as leaders, we need to lead self, we need to lead others, lead our teams. We then progress to leading organizations and, and in many of your cases, leading ecosystems. Um, but we always come back to leading self because leading self really underpins all of those other things. Um, and I, I often think and talk about you know, two types of leader. You can be an, what I call I've arrived leader. Um, this kind of lead, leader is, is contributing to the problem of inclusivity, not helping to um, resolve it. An I'm arrived leader seeks power, and once he or she um, secures that power, holds on to power. Uh, and their effort goes into maintaining that power base. Another type of leader, the other type of leader, I believe, is a come with me type of leader. And that type of leader is always looking to how much more they can do to contribute. What more can they do to build inclusivity for others, to come with me? So it's about sharing power, it's about growth mindset, moving forward, and not just moving forward, but bringing others with us. Um, and I think for me, I mean, there are many, many tools, as all of you know, Cala Delegates, our platform is full of them. Um, it was great to hear about influencing because I think influencing others is uh, always the most popular of our courses among Cala delegates. But tools aside, I think if, if you can keep this, um, this mindset uh, front and center, this idea of being a come with me leader, to me, that's what's going to build inclusivity. Um, the system stuff is important. Absolutely agree. The quotas are important. All of those kind of system level, that system level thinking that the people in this room have an incredible amount of influence over. That's absolutely important. But start with yourselves. We must start with ourselves um, to be come with me leaders, not I've arrived leaders. So always seeking to go further build ourselves and bring others with us, sharing power and amplifying other people's voices. For me, that's the starting point for inclusive leadership. Great, thank you, Rebecca. And, and I wanted to turn to you, Ndidi. What, what do you think are the hurdles leaders will face in driving inclusion? What do you think are the three critical hurdles that leaders will face in driving inclusion for food systems transformation in Africa? Thank you. So I would say that probably I'll use different lenses. So from an SME lens, I'm a co-founder of a food company called Ace Foods. And Ace Foods is in Sango Ota. We process spices, snacks, and complementary food. Now, I'm Igbo, so inclusivity is also ethnicity, right? You need to have different voices. But our factory is in Sango Ota. So right now, we have 90% Eurobuzz, right? And because Sango Ota is a Yoruba part of Nigeria, we have so little diversity in the organization, um, and we've set a target, and that's why he said targets. We're come with us leaders, definitely, but we, we're struggling to recruit diversity in the communities where we serve. And so what we've had to do is go out of our comfort zone. And so one hurdle is money. To recruit people who are not from that community, you have to be willing to go the extra mile to find them, to fund them and to locate them. And that's something we've had to do because we want to serve Nigeria. We want to serve a global uh, international entity. Now we have 90% Yoruba, 90% women in production, but in the management team, we have 80% men. So then we've had to say, how can we groom our women into the, product, the senior management team? And we realize of the women who are in manage, uh, production, most of them are entry-level staff, and they're not literate. So we had to start an adult literacy program. And I'm so proud that our last Christmas, graduate, uh, Christmas party, 40 women graduated from our adult literacy program. And so these women came in without speaking or reading, reading or writing. Now they can read and write. It's a conscious effort, but that hurdle is the cost 
and the time it takes to build an inclusive organization where you're an SME and you're saying, well, I have to manage my costs, I have to be profitable. How do you then say we're going to prioritize this because diversity and inclusion ultimately makes financial sense. It sets you up for long-term sustainability, but in the short term, there are costs. So I'm making it practical because it's not cheap, right, to be inclusive. It takes extra effort. It takes you being very conscious and deliberate and setting management targets and management goals and holding the management accountable for delivering on those goals because it's so easy for us to recruit people who look like us, who speak like us, who are like us. Imagine as co-founders, when we go to the Christmas party and everybody's speaking Yoruba and we're Igbo. I don't even understand the language and they have to interpret it. And you know, it's, 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 it, you have to get out of yourself and say, I'm building a comp company that would outlive me. So that's critical. In addition, sharing power, and she talked about this, we give equity to our team members to get them to stay. So you share resources, you share power, and you also share success. And step out of the limelight for others to step into it. The second biggest barrier is a mindset barrier. And I think it's deep, it's entrenched. And I've worked with a lot of gender groups, and we do a lot with Sahel Consulting and Gender, and I go to male-dominated settings, and I say there's a pie that's big enough for all of us. Men and women can rise together. Me rising doesn't mean that you fall. And that mindset shift has to change in Africa. Um, and it has to start from the home. Uh, and I think many of us are victims. I've had to learn about my own biases, and it's good to have a daughter who holds me accountable to say, you have to treat me and my brother the same, right? Or tells her father, you have to come and wash dishes. Everybody's washing dishes, even in our context. And so we have to do that from the home, but beyond the home, even in our companies. Equal pay, equal mobility, right? Equal promotions. And then make sure that you, you're creating safe spaces for women. And I talk about this because I hope Kala has a session on uh, sexual harassment. One of the biggest issues that I've started to face in all the companies I've started is the issue around sexual harassment. And I often thought, oh, I, I, I am a women-led organization. I create safe spaces for women. In the last few months, we've had to revamp our sexual harassment policies and ensure that we train and retrain and have zero tolerance for bad behavior. And Kala, if you don't have that in your curriculum, ethics and sexual harassment have to be explicitly addressed because there's a power dynamic that happens, especially as people rise and they get more power. And, and unfortunately, in our context, this is not addressed enough. And then, the, so how do we rebalance that power and change mindsets and re, re, rewire our mindsets to know we can rise together and create safe spaces for each other? And then the final barrier, I would say, is really around incentives. How do we create incentives for people to change behavior and disincentives for people who do not? And this is where funding comes into place. And I'm glad I'm sitting with Roy. I challenge funders to prioritize tracking the data on how many women-led organizations they fund, how many local organizations they fund, have how many African-led organizations they fund. Because there's still, even in Africa, racial inequity where a lot more foreign organizations get funding in Africa than African organizations, and that has to stop. And so when we start challenging our funders to track this data and ensure that they also use that carrot, the money, to rebalance and ensure inclusion, we're going to see change happen. And I think all of us working together, we're going to make a difference. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Roy, can I turn to you and ask quickly, what sort of investments do you think leaders should make in driving an inclusive food systems? That's a really difficult question. <laughs> I think it's the investing, investments in what Nindidi has just said, is you invest in, in your own capacity to make inclusive decisions. Uh, and, that's, and that's not easy. Um, but I'll, I'll get back to you if I have any more thoughts on that. <laughs> I'll pass it back. Okay, great. Thanks, Roy. Um, I will turn to you, uh, Professor Von Braun. I, I, I actually wanted to focus on something that Didi mentioned earlier uh, around data. So how, how do you think data can support leadership to drive inclusive food systems? And what do you think the challenge is with, you know, in getting the right data to support decision making or to support program delivery that is inclusive for transformation? 
Well, you need to have your facts right. And that means you know, uh, have to know the data in the uh, activity which you are leading or which you aspire to lead. Um, so, um, the data business is massively increasing um, due to digitization, um, the extension services more and more in food systems are, um, are using uh, digital uh, platforms. So uh, being a leader in the data business is in itself an area. So um, build digital platforms, connect them to, to those people who, who will use the services is a, a critical area of future leadership in food systems transformation. Knowing your facts, however, requires also respect. Respect for the people whose data you are using. Otherwise, they will not deliver the data to you. They want to know what is uh, done with my data, be they farmer or consumers or small businesses and so on. So, a lot of attention to data, to data platforms, the new tendencies of artificial intelligence applied to the food systems transformation requires that you connect, and there I repeat myself, you connect to science, to the science platforms. Science is open for that. Look at the local university and college in your country, the academies of sciences, and the data platforms in the private sector. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. So I'm going to turn to you, Dr. Kalibata, actually. And I need you because we are now going to start taking part in shots, um, particularly so that the lead, these leaders can remember your words as they go through the program. What do you want to see in our leaders that assures you that our food systems are transforming? What would you like to see? What, what do you think they should, they should be doing differently that, you, that will assure you that you know, our food systems are transforming, or will transform. Okay, so I see two parts to that question. What do I want to see in leaders? And then how does that inform food systems transforming? Maybe given that we now have this color uh, platform, that is a huge opportunity for young people to come together to think through leadership. Maybe one thing that I would like to see people take away is the fact that the world, if you think the world has changed at any point in time, it's changed because someone took leadership. And if you think there's any great leader out there, there's nobody that is born great. Leadership is an acquired skill. Leadership is something you can acquire. Leadership is something you go out to get and also you decide to live. Whether you're leading from the front or leading from behind, you decide to be a leader. And the world will change because you've made that decision. So what is the one thing that you lead with in the food system? Is it how we access food? Is it how we work together to ensure that the food system is improving? Is it how we stop doing the wrong things in the food system? So I'll go back, because this is a very complex system, so there's no one thing. But the one thing I would love for you to take away is, you can be a leader, and when you be that leader, our food systems will change, because you're part of them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kalibata. And I'll go to you, Rebecca, very quickly. Tell me, what is the one thing that you would like to see uh, happening in the landscape that assures you that we are actually uh, driving food systems uh, uh, in, in, in the continent? What is just that one thing? Thank you. 
Thanks, Apollos. Um, with, I guess with, with my very biased Kala hat on, um, I would like to see this community of Kala leaders stepping out, just as Dr. Kalabata has said. Um, I, I think there's an incredible amount of influence in this room um, and also in, in the first cohort of leaders. And an incredible opportunity, really, for each of you to decide to lead, as Dr. Kalabata said. So how can each of us harness the resources at our disposal, whether it's budget, whether it's people and teams, whether it's influence, whether it's networks, to drive transformation in food systems? And how can we be come with me leaders who bring others with us, include others, share power, and amplify, amplify the voices of other people? Great. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. And Roy, to you, what, is, what, what, what would you like them to hold on to as they go through this program that will take them beyond just the journey of finishing a program, but to actually live out, you know, their leadership roles in driving food systems. What, should, what is that one thing they should hold on to? I, I think I was struck by what you said, Rebecca, which is it always comes down to yourself, the self, and, and, our, and we're all on this journey to become the best human beings we can possibly be, and, and leadership is about that. And I think to the extent that we can act in a more noble way, in a more selfless way, uh, the more likely we are to achieve our greatest potential. Um, but there's a mix. We're all a mix between selfishness and selflessness. And I think, and, and we have to recognize that. I had a one friend who said, you have to be 70% selfless and 30% selfish. I don't know how she came up with those numbers, but I think that's kind of roughly correct, is that yeah, we do have to take care of ourselves and our families, but true leaders are thinking about much more than themselves. They're thinking about their community, the society, the world, and they are motivated by love for that community, for nature, for, uh, for others. And if you don't have that love for others, you, I don't think, will be a good leader. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. And Didi, um, I've heard whispers of, of the fact that um, you know, everyone says you're very resilient and the way you push through change, you know, with that level of boldness, what is your secret? What should they, what, what should they take away from you? So I'd say the first thing is faith. You have to, your life has to be anchored in, in a faith. My, my resilience is rooted in my faith in God and my relationship with God. But for, the, for the, those of you who are out there, I'd say you have to be in legacy mode. What will you be remembered for? What impact would you have had in the food systems because you have lived? And there's, there are two proverbs, African proverbs, that give me energy and drive me. One is an African proverb that says, do not follow the path. Go where there is no path and leave a trail. The leaders who have come before you did not solve the food crisis in Africa. So you need to be the one to go where there is no path and leave a trail. It will be lonely, but you can do it, right? because you have faith, because you have conviction, because you have integrity, and because you want to leave a legacy. And the second proverb says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with others. Now, we have to go fast and far together. And to do that, we have to leave our egos and logos at the door, and we have to work with integrity and excellence. Integrity and excellence have no hiding place, and Africa needs leaders with integrity and excellence. So go out and be those leaders. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Didi. And Prof, I turn to you to actually not just give your final thoughts, but also to actually, um, you know, live with them. How do you build a knowledge system that is inclusive? You combine that with your final thoughts, please. <clears throat> well, to all these words of wisdom, which we just heard. Let me add one other concept, and that is trust. As leaders, you must earn trust, and you must trust the people who you lead. Those are essential concepts, and it's a very difficult concept, especially in countries where we currently have turmoil in Africa where um, society is conflict-ridden. 
but there is no leadership without trust and building trust around you. The knowledge system which you need um, is right at your doorsteps. You have it. African uh, knowledge and research institutions get stronger and stronger. They have become internationally competitive in many fields in agriculture. The 16 agricultural research um, uh, colleges, universities in East Africa, the uh, 12 in West Africa, they are good. Work with them. Otherwise, you are uh, left alone. You, so you have to make the effort to be part of the knowledge system which is surrounding you. Lastly, I think it's important that um, um, the bigger vision we are aiming for, which you are aiming for in Africa, is not forgotten. We want to have not just a transformation of the food system, we want to have a competitive food system, a system that is competitive in Africa and in the rest of the world. So, uh, the business concepts for competition are clear. So, use uh, cost leadership or um, other concepts so that you are competing and that Africa overcomes the import dependency of um, its food economy. So, these are business concepts which government, civil society and private sector uh, can adhere to. Trust and competitiveness go together. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Dr. Kalibata, Professor Von Brown, Ms. Ndidi Muneli, Roy Stenner, Rebecca Harrison, thank you for those golden insights. And uh, we do appreciate the fact that you took your time out to speak to this set of leaders. They'll be looking to you as we go through this uh, 16 months and we'll be drawing from your insights and your leadership. Thank you, everyone.